Did you know that fluctuations in our blood sugar can actually influence our nervous system and how our body responds to stress? On today's episode, we are talking about the nervous system, our visual system, and how the different bodily sensations we get can trigger different reactions. One vital way to start supporting our nervous system is actually to start supporting our blood sugar. Our amazing sponsor for today's episode is Very, a continuous glucose monitoring system with a very simple to apply patch that's paired with an app for you to find out real time information about your blood sugar. Very is an excellent tool to find those personalized insights on what's really working with your body and for your body so that you can truly quiet the diet outside of you and listen to what your body needs. If we've learned to feel unsafe within our body or lack trust, we sometimes can't understand or interpret those bodily signals. And getting that information externally through data, even for just this 14-day period, can give you valuable insights into what that communication between your body and brain is. If you want to find the right foods and habits for your individual body while still improving your health, please give Very a shot with our exclusive $30 off code vsm diet and check out the link in the description notes to purchase directly from their website. Hi, I'm Michelle Shapiro, Integrative Functional Registered Dietitian and host of the Quiet the Diet podcast. On this episode of Quiet the Diet, I'm sitting down with Coach Alyssa Chang, who is a brain-based movement coach and really employs a lot of understanding around how our visual system influences our nervous system. In this episode, you'll learn how to regulate your nervous system by doing simple visual tasks and what else we can do to regulate our nervous system, which can influence all matters of our health. We can't wait to see you in there. I can't believe we made it here. You know, it feels it feels like this is a, a moment that we've been coming to, like a peak of my life, and we've made it to this moment. Yes. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you here today, Alyssa. Thank you. I'm always so honored. <laughs> when you asked me, I was like, yes, of course, I'm honored. <laughs> you're, there, you're literally the least awkward person and the most smiley and giggly and full of wisdom that I know you're going to share with everyone today. So I'm very happy to have you on for personal reasons um, and also for myself, knowledge reasons. I feel like every conversation we have, it's the flowiest, the deepest, the most educational, um, and you're willing to kind of go to places, I think, in your brain that other people aren't. So I'm willing to, I'm, I'm eager to go to those places with you today. Mm, yes, I love our conversation. So this is just like a recorded conversation with Michelle and Alyssa. <laughs> exactly. For our listeners, you guys. Okay. <laughs> Alyssa, first, I will have, you guys just heard Alyssa's introduction, of course, but Alyssa, can you introduce yourself and tell us just what part of your healing journey, your life brought you to this amazing practitioner that you are today? Oh, thank you, Michelle. Um, yes. Yeah, so I work as a neuroscience health coach. A lot of my relationship to like health was more performance based. I grew up as a collegiate athlete playing like a lot of volleyball from the age of 10. And then after I graduated college, I kind of navigated this very interesting transition, which I feel is really common of when your identity is attached so much to one thing. And then that thing ends, you're just kind of floating in the space of like, well, what do what do I do now with myself, with my body, with my training? So I actually continued to train like an athlete. And I was like, I actually don't need to do this anymore, but I didn't know how to train any other way. <laughs> and so I had a friend at the time just introduced me to this concept of bodybuilding. And he was like, Hey, you should look into figure competitions. And I didn't know what that was. So I Googled it. And if you ever Google figure com com competitors up, will pop like these seemingly very happy very fulfilled, lean, quote unquote, beautiful women. And, you know, I was just immediately pulled towards that. And so I was like, well, I want to be fit, healthy and happy. So, I, and I was, I love new challenges. Why not? Let's make things harder. And so I decided to compete, spent a year in that traditional eating tilapia, asparagus, training two hours a day, and then the weight training. brown rice bodybuilder diet that yes. we always think of. Totally. Yes, yeah. yes. And, you know, through that process, I, you know, was definitely getting sicker and sicker and it really doing a great job of ignoring all my symptoms and such a tunnel vision of like, I have to get on the stage no matter what, like I will do all the unhealthy, like very extreme types of things. And so I got on stage and, you know, competed, finished that, and then navigated a season probably about 
three to four years where my body was really rebelling against me. And so everything that I knew as a, as a personal trainer at that point just didn't work for me. I was like, well, if I, you know, have pain, I'm going to do this. If I have digestive, you know, kind of flare ups, let me take out the gluten, take out the soy, take out like all these things and everything just didn't work. I kept getting sicker. I gained like probably about 65 pounds in a very short amount of time. It was probably like five, six months at that point. Had extreme inflammation. I mean, walking upstairs, I had so much knee pain, back pain. I got bouts of vertigo, leaky gut syndrome, depression, anxiety, like the host of ailments and nothing traditional was really working. So then I kind of fell into this world of neuroscience through a bunch of mentors I was working alongside. And it was like, I remember my mentor was like, this will change your client's lives. And I remember thinking like, well, let's do that. Like, that sounds great. Like I'm going to change more lives. And my first course, we talked about like how important your vision system is and how important like tongue mobility is and your breath. And I remember this quote that they said that fitness and the fitness world tends to train everything from the neck down, but yet everything that's so close to the brain is forgotten about. And so as I stepped into that space, I started to really understand, wow, my body is this wonderful vessel for me to experience the world. And I've spent so many years like punishing her, manipulating her, pushing her, ignoring her. And then it became this transition of like, oh, what does she need? Let me talk to her. What, you know, is she hungry? Does she need more sleep? And so it was the beginning of such a beautiful partnership. And in that partnership, I have now, I would say, arrived at a place where I'm far more compassionate. I know my, myself better and as a result, know my body better. And I do this work a lot with my students, adopting this neuroscience lens, helping them heal. And you would say, because you talked a lot about, first of all, thank you. And you, I know you would say this, but I'm going to ask you a leading question. You would say that one of the most integral parts of your healing, your physical ailments was actually the application of these neuroscience principles. Correct. Yes. Yes. It was such a, a like weird concept. And I was very resistant because I'm inherently very like a questioner. Like I can't just move my eyes or do like retrain my breathing and that's going to heal my metabolism. Like this just doesn't make sense. And yet it made a lot of sense. So I just like got to a place where nothing was working. And so I was moving from a place of honestly desperation, but like a sliver of hope. And, uh, you know, neuroscience is coined the science or no plasticity is coined the science of hope. And so, um, I remember at the certification, they gave those like wristbands and, uh, on it, it said the science of hope. And I remember just wearing that and thinking like, I just am like using that small little guiding light as like a hopeful, like I can get better. Yeah. Yeah. So when you say even neuroplasticity, can you walk it back all oh, you, you and I love walking it back. Can you walk back even defining what neuroplasticity at the most basic level means for people? Yeah. So neuroplasticity is your brain's ability to rewire itself. So over the years, we've, you know, experienced a lot of things in our lives. Um, trauma being a very big category of, you know, you can break that down into lived experiences in your body. So physical trauma, emotional trauma, upbringing, all of those pieces that then has mapped your brain to attune to safety in a, in a very specific way. And safety is inherently something that the brain desires, needs uh, in order to move through the world. But what I define as safety, what you define as safety is going to be very different. And so we want to acknowledge that neuroplasticity is how our brain has really shaped and formed in a way to move through the world that makes the most sense for our brain and body to feel safe and to survive. And then just again, on the super baseline level, your goal would be to improve what would the word be you would have to improve neuroplasticity, to increase, to enhance? What word would you use? That's a great question. I would say a lot of people desire to change how they feel. And I think when we understand that we can change like the hardwiring of what we think we can't change through neuroplasticity, that's the hopefulness, right? It's like, I'm not stuck in this person who like is inconsistent and can never get to my goals. It's like, well, maybe there's actually this very scientific reasoning as to why this habit you can't change is actually ranking higher in your safety needs. And what we need to do in order to change is to really identify like what is how, what has been unsafe for you in the past that has made you feel quote unquote inconsistent. 
can we make safer next steps that then essentially will get you to your, get you to your goal in a much more like enjoyable, hopefully way. I mean, we both know healing is never that pretty, but if we can have it's pockets, it's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> So my clients are like, why am I feeling worse? I'm like, this is normal. It's like when you start to get yeah, yeah. aware, right? It's just like, oh my God, I'm totally. sitting with all this stuff. So yeah. Totally. Yeah. You're just experiencing the things that your body wanted you to experience, but that you desperately tried to not experience for a very long time. So <laughs> at some point it comes to a head where you experience them for sure. Yes. yes. So we are definitely going to talk about safety. It's really funny. I was just thinking the so far for the episodes we've recorded for this season, All three guests so far have been talking about neuroscience, brain-based approaches to healing. And I'm like, I think that, you know, while over the years as a dietitian, I have found different healing modalities to be more or less effective for individual clients. So some people work well with some things, some people work well with others. It just feels like a lot of the healing process and a lot of the, uh, what I think initiates the healing process does come back to the brain so much. Mm -hmm. And that so much so that it might be every episode this season. People might hear me say sympathetic nervous system like 4,000 times this season. And I'm going to apologize in advance. Um, But I, I don't think there's ever enough talking about it because I think there is kind of a block to healing that comes for a lot of people. And I do think it comes from the brain. Um, mm-hmm. and I know that you certainly believe that cause you're a neuroscience based coach. So of course you believe that too. And you've experienced it and seen it in your clients too. We are going to talk hugely about that topic. You just brought up of feeling stuck, feeling like you can't push forward. And what the, I think you work in a way that takes the pressure off of people to feel like they have to willpower things through. Mm. So when we say something is brain based, we mean it's on like a subconscious level, not on a conscious level. And the retraining can happen on a conscious level, but the goal is to actually influence the subconscious level. So instead of just forcing your body to do things, it's to bring your body and your brain into coherence. um, So they're all working on the same page, but I don't want anyone to take one, you know, Alyssa or I use brain-based coaching or brain-based initiation to mean my brain is broken and I have to do other things or different things and I have to work harder. It doesn't mean work harder. It usually means work differently um, than what you would expect. And one of those ways that's very interesting that you work really differently is this visual coaching. So can you just like super quickly draw this line between our visual system and our nervous system? Yeah. So the, there's this statistic that I learned in my certifications that we basically experience the world. Like our eyes are our first windows into the world. So we rely so heavily on our visual system to interpret if we're safe or if we're not safe. Is there danger? Is there a tiger around the corner? Right. We often reference this tiger and that sympathetic fight or flight response. And we have two eyes, but they work together. And so I do vision assessments with my clients to better understand like, well, if our eyes are taking a 90% of our environment to determine if we're safe or unsafe. And I have a client who has these symptoms of anxiety, rumination, uh, lack of willpower. I then want to assess from a movement standpoint, well, how are their eyes moving? Are their eyes working for them the same way we're thinking about is my body working for me? When I was going through my whole journey, my eyes were just like exhausted. They just weren't working like really together. I had one eye that was extremely suppressed, creating an extreme domination or dominance in the other side. And we can think about it the same way we think about muscles is when we have asymmetry, well, there's going to be natural compensation. There's going to be a domino effect. It could all trickle down to, well, if my eyes are not working well, then I'm going to have more neck tension with my more neck tension. I hold my breathing is going to change. If my breathing's more in hyperventilation. I'm going to definitely be more anxious. If I'm more anxious, not breathing well, I'm not digesting foods well. So I could go to any like traditional approach to address my anxiety and I may get medication. And again, there's nothing wrong with medication except for me. I was like, there's something more to this, this puzzle piece that I know there's things that are like connecting and trickling into one another. And so I started to look at this nervous system lens. And so we have all these lobes in our brain and we have this whole lobe that's called the occipital lobe that interprets again, all that, all the moving pieces. We have all these ways we're supposed to be able to move our eyes efficiently without pain, without tension. And yet most of us, right, are on screens. We're really fixated on a specific target, a specific distance, the blue light exposure, like all of that automatically puts our brain into that sympathetic. Yeah. So and, we, and we're going to dive even deeper into that because that's so important. I don't. I think the sentence 
that you just said, even like that the our blue light is influencing our vision, which is then influencing our nervous system, even that relationship is not n- naturally known to people or like something that they would know without learning this right now. So I think that that's so powerful. I think even the fact that we tie our visual lobe to our occipital lobe, like obviously the back of your head is where that occipital lobe is. Thinking about like your brain being the organ of vision, we think it's only in our eyes, but whatever happens to the back of our head is going to affect our vision too. So it's very powerful in and of itself. I, I will tell you also an anecdote about my own life, which is that about like six years ago, I think, I got diagnosed with binocular vision dysfunction and which is basically what Alyssa was talking about when your eyes are not moving at the same pace, like one eye and the other eye are not um, coming back together in the same time frame. And I went to a medical intuitive at the time who was like, yeah, your eyes don't want to open because they don't want to see like that's she's like in the most like, you know, spiritual way. She was like, your eyes are not doing what you want them to do because they're exhausted, like you said, Alyssa, and they don't want more visual stimuli. They want less. They don't want to see. And so they're not able to keep up with that demand. And then from a very kind of physical standpoint, can we also talk about, that's maybe the spiritual standpoint of for you, like that that example of exhaustion. Can we talk about how our vision and our nervous system can also affect muscle movement and like the direction of like which muscles are activated or not too? Yeah. Fantastic question. I love you kind of highlighting that spiritual aspect because everything is so, I mean, it's just mind boggling. The more I learn about myself, listen to podcasts, all those things. It's just like, you're like, wow, we are just these amazing creatures that like so much gratitude for our bodies, right? Like, wow. (laughs) We're so integrated and cool. Yeah. Um, and also just knowing that there's all these avenues of how you can approach your health. I think that was reassuring for me because when something didn't work, I was like, okay, if I did my vision drills this day and I don't feel like my pain had gone away, well, okay, let me go to my other toolkit and maybe I need to journal and like brain dump and process out some emotions that maybe were like building up in my body. And then I'm like, oh wow, my pain definitely like went down a notch. So multiple avenues. I think that's one thing you and I definitely agree upon. Okay. So vision, just millions. I mean, by the way, (laughs) the the visual system and muscles. So what's really fascinating is, you know, as my clients start to, and the people that I work with just start to really understand that interconnectedness of like, wow, your eyes just rely so heavily on our eyes. Sometimes we need to move them. Sometimes we actually, like you mentioned, just need less incoming information. So some of you may feel fantastic wearing sunglasses when you're working out because you're removing light. And sometimes light could be just that added form of input that puts you into that more like sympathetic, oh my God, I'm like really on edge. Um, so with muscles, the fascinating thing is when we move our eyes up, so head stays neutral, flashing our eyes up, it helps facilitate all of our extension muscles. So all the muscles in the back body. So your posterior chain, glutes, hamstrings, when we flash our eyes down, it actually facilitates flexion. So you can think about when you are at your computer, like where do your eyes typically sit? When we look at our phones, it's typically in that flexion, kind of like head down, neck down, chin down, eyes down. And yet what we can also kind of attune to is that computer posture syndrome that we see a lot of people like showing up with, right? They have that forward head, they have that hunched shoulders, the collapsing of the front body, and they could do all the dumbbell rows, all the cable seated rows, strengthen the back, and they probably would have the same posture for a really long time. They could get massages, open up the chest, the therapist would be like, you have really tight pecs. And they'd be like, okay, yeah, like, what do I do? Okay, stretch your pecs. But what they really are missing, the missing link is they are not utilizing that visual system and extension. So if you just sit and flash your eyes up, you might notice like, wow, I've not done this in a really long time. I feel strain and stress on my eyes. And yet what you might notice is the more you place your eyes in extension, you do vision therapy in extension, you might naturally notice you're up, you're able to hold your posture upright because posture is very reflexive. It, we can definitely like, you know, we can crank our shoulders back elevate our chest, shine our chest forward. But over time, we're going to get tired. Our muscles aren't meant to hold us in that position. And you can think about how often we might be relying on our muscular turn. And if we're only relying on our muscles, what ends up happening is that can also be extremely taxing and fatiguing. And then what could happen from there? We may get irritable 
in our second meeting because we're exhausted from just holding ourselves upright. Then we reach for snacks. Then we get, you know, reactive at our coworker. And it's just this domino effect. So if we can actually get to the root issue of like, well, your, your eyes actually play a role in facilitating extension. Well, let's do some vision therapy. Oh, wow. I'm just naturally holding myself up right now. It's so one thing that I want to pull that you said that's so important for people to understand is like, you know, when people say you have bad posture, put, you know, grandmas are yes. like, put your shoulders back, you, you know, stop hunching over. What you're saying is that just doing the physical movement of pushing your shoulders back repeatedly isn't going to really change your posture that much. And it's certainly going to exhaust you because you're activating those same muscles that are already quite tired. It seems like, um, yes. all the time. So what you're saying is you can start kind of activating if, if, if I'm reading you right, you can correct me, but you can start activating the muscles literally by just directing through your eyes, which muscle mm -hmm. groups should be, you know, flexing or which muscle groups should be. Is that true? Yeah. So once I have my clients kind of go through like a vision assessment, we get an identity, you know, like a clarity on like, oh, this eye's moving less, this eye's moving more. They're both moving great in versus out. Then we do some vision therapy. And then once they kind of have a very, a clear vision map, meaning your brain has this, these different maps of every body part. Once it gets clear, then we start to tack on vision therapy on top of like, let's say dumbo rows. So every time someone is moving into flexion, I actually have them facilitate with their eyes. So an easier example is push-ups. Let's say I have my client going down into their push-up, they're going into flexion, head stays neutral, they flash their eyes down. So they're not only getting the neural charge and neural drive of flexion from their eyes, they're also getting flexion in their body. Then before they initiate back up, they flash their eyes up and then extend at their arms. So what they typically will notice is, well, a couple of things I should say. Sometimes it's really hard in the beginning because they're actually flipped. So they flash their eyes down and it actually feels harder. And then they, they go the other way. So it's like a mismatch. They call it mismatch. So what we need to do first is repair them in the way that the brain is actually supposed to be paired. But when they get there, then when they do push-ups, they're cranking up push-ups like they're so strong. They hit PRs. They're so resilient. And it's not that I put them in like a five by five program or like we have to train for three months. I'm like, let's get your eyes to work with your muscles, to work with your body. And then all of a sudden they're feeling so resilient, so strong, so confident. And it's like, we just almost like, I mean, everyone's like, what is this stuff? Right? No one, uh, not no one, but everyone is just kind of like, this is like magic. But I'm like, oh, it's actually just neuroscience. Like, <laughs> if you understand the brain, it's like just every very, very simple neuroscience <laughs> that is definitive and we've got locked down. That's all that it is. Exactly. Yeah. But the idea that we can, it's almost like you're helping if, if I'm having this vision, like there's a command center in your head and you, instead of using the conscious part of your brain to like direct the command center and to direct the muscles, you're just like kind of handing a piece of paper, to the command center. And you're like, here, do this for me. And that makes all of those movements easier. And it's, it's really that a lot of us are, the reason we think we're stuck or exhausted is because we're working against what our body is asking us to do. And we're working from the bottom up as opposed to from the top down. Mm -hmm. It seems like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do I think you, sure you know that movie inside out obsessed. Yeah. I mean, you and I like talk about internal family systems and, and that movie yes. inside out literally constantly tell, tell everyone. Like, well, just imagine that movie. like it's based off of emotions, right? But what if it was also based on structures of the brain? So like your cerebellum is this part of the brain that controls what we call your movement ABC. So how accurate you are, how balanced you are. So balance isn't, I need to stand on this BOSU ball for, you know, three times a day, you know, 30 seconds at a time, it's like, well, you actually have this part of your brain that controls balance or plays a role in it. Accuracy, balance, uh, coordination. So those of you that never played sports, it actually is a brain thing. It's not like you're not athletic. It's like, well, if we train the cerebellum, you might be able to catch the ball, shoot a basketball um, and inhibition. So let's say there's actually like, you know, instead of joy, it's like, oh, you have the cerebellum and the cerebellum needs to come online. So to say, get the controls and be like, Oh, Alyssa's playing a sport. Now I need to make sure that I'm like ready. Mm -hmm. And I'm like on and there and there to work with her when she's playing volleyball. So imagine that you have all these little control guys, like living in your brain, that's helping you just perform again, optimally for you with you. Do you, when you're talking about kind of directing which muscles to flex or which muscles like to do different things, is the brain signal causing an actual muscle activity? Is it causing a direction of blood supply? What's the, the actual thing that is happening? 
when to repeat the first part of the question. So if you're doing like a visual drill to make Mm. the push-ups happen better or correctly, and then people are able to do them more, is that because neurologically it is influencing which muscle is turned on or activating, or is it directing blood flow to the area? Maybe both. That's a great question. I would say it's a combination of both because the more the, how I understand it is more of like, it's basically creating that neural drive in the quotations. A lot of people use that term neural drive. So it's creating all those neurons directly feeding into the occipital lobe that then is feeding into, right? Like then the musculature, then the activation, then the contractions. Yeah. So interesting. It's 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 so, so so cool. So when I, you know, I, I've talked about this a little bit on a podcast before, but I had like a, a, a bout of dysautonomia, long COVID. And I was so amazed by my amazing hypermobility coach, Taylor Goldberg, because she was really explaining a lot more about how COVID directly it seemed to influence proprioceptors and then also influenced like the COVID specifically as a virus was very unique in that it was really affecting the way that our brain influences which muscles, which muscle groups move. And it seems to have caused that attack either like we're like maybe on the blood vessels it caused the attack a little bit because of the oxidative stress. Maybe it was a little bit on the brain, but I'm finding in a lot of my clients now that if they're having this mast cell or dysautonomia, which I'm having more and more clients with that, honestly, since COVID because of just, you know, the actual impact of the virus combined with a lot of other factors, not just the virus itself. Um, I found it so fascinating, this like nervous system muscle relationship, this blood vessel muscle relationship and how you would think like training your way out of it is going to help you. But if you're not directing the correct muscle groups to activate, it can actually be far more exhausting for people. So are there groups of people who, and or maybe every person who just can train, 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 but if they're not brain training, they're not going to get the same results or in fact may feel worse from doing more. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a large population. I think unfortunately that's the philosophy that's been adopted in the health and fitness space for so many years. I mean, I, yeah, Mm. I'm one of them, right. One of them who just had, I would say a high level resiliency for the amount of load I was placing on my nervous system and my body until it could no longer carry all that. So then we're navigating a very interesting, again, that transition where people are, you know, probably arriving at our steps and they're thinking like, I used to, right. We often hear this like, oh, when I, you know, a year ago, like I used to be able to do all these things. I used to be able to do all this stuff. And one of the best questions I was taught to ask my students is, well, what happened before it happened? Because there's always this building of stress, right? And our brain is going to do a fantastic job when something feels, you know, like a little uneasy, a little too uncomfortable. It might just compartmentalize it. We distract away from it. We avoid it. We disconnect from it until, right, that red, that little, we call it a threat bucket, right? That continues to fill and fill and fill. And then the output of that is going to be some very unique pain symptom. And depending on how long you've been kind of pushing through pain signals, ignoring the body, that one time you pick up a pen off the floor and then throw out your back or, you know, you eat this one thing and then it cascades all these different kind of metabolic syndromes. It does in some ways make sense. If you take the time to look at someone's health history. And it's never really one thing, like you're saying, Mm -hmm. it was a unique past couple of years for people who, you know, and I work with some of my clients like over five years. And it's just like you, Alessa, you have these very long-term, very close relationships with your clients. And I'm seeing all these new kind of things. And I was like, what happened in the past few years? And there's just so many things based on what we're talking about that happened, right? There's just so many things. Forget about it being like a massive trauma, feeling like Mm -hmm. that for so many people. But just the fact that we switch in so many means to this virtual world, there's just such a higher demand on our visual system and as a result on our nervous system and as a result on our muscular, you know, I don't know, system or muscles. Um, and, and then on top of that, you have the added stress. And then on top of that, you may have had a virus, the virus, other viruses, you're in your home more. So there might be environmental toxicants. Mm -hmm. You're with your family more. They might feel like an environmental toxicant. You know, that's, it was everything all at once. But I think one of the things that, you know, you really bring to the table is that brought to the table today and always brings to the table, but (laughs) is that it's not one thing, right? Like it's Mm -hmm. always a combination of all these things. But I think the past few years have been, especially in your realm, 
distinctly challenging to the nervous system, which is why I cannot stop talking about it this season yeah. or in general, because it's kind of the whole game right now for people. Like it, it is what it really feels like because all of these things are unique challenges on the body, but they're also unique challenges to the nervous system. Or have mm-hmm. you seen that in the past few years, changes in existing clients or new clients coming in? Yeah. And I'm, it's really interesting. I love that you're bringing this up because I feel when the pandemic hit, there was the social distancing mandated. There was the Zoom, the collective trauma. In my brain, I was like, we're going to see very interesting symptoms surface in a few years. Because what you're going to notice is when there's ever tragedy or trauma, you're going to witness people move into their default trauma responses, right? Maybe like for me, I was like, I'm going to put together a program that's going to help support people. And like, I just went straight into that. We were talking about making one together, Alyssa. We were completely (laughs) out of control. We were like, oh, we got to deliver. We got to deliver. We got to help. We got to help. Exactly. And we were like active together at that time. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And then after, you know, that kind of initial uptick, there's a settling. Typically there, then there's a lull. And then there's this, what I like to call, like call a neural hangover where mm-hmm. it's, you've been living in such a activated state. And we also want to remember that the freeze response, which can like show up as like someone being disconnected, they're actually very activated internally. So they are, even though they are frozen on the surface internally, there's so much chaos. So the neural hangover is just this kind of expected outcome for the amount of survival we were all living in. And if you had gotten like actual COVID, right, you're, you were naming such like all the nuances of what people were experiencing. And, you know, there's brain inflammation. When the brain is inflamed, it's not going to be able to work to its fullest capacity. So you may, you might have brain fog, right? You might be flubbing your words, like unable to articulate your thoughts. But in addition to that, you might be more depressed. You might have felt, you know, the social isolation was extremely extremely triggering yeah especially for that was interesting for all my extroverts like how do they self-regulate because for a lot of them they you know love that form i mean we all inherently need it but for them there was so much of that self-regulation with others you know or co-regulation as we coin it but yeah so this neural hangover aspect has been something i've noticed for sure and then it's like that weird transition of like, okay, I think there's vaccinations and I think that it's kind of safer, but then like you would see your friend and you're like, do we, like, what is the norm? <laughs> Cause you used to just go and hug. And now it's like, I don't know how they feel. How do I feel? What's the safety protocol? And it was like this really weird reintroduction of like being social that so many of us, like, even for me being out of practice, I went to something and I was like, wow, you are out of practice. <laughs> like, you don't know no, how to have a conversation. So no, come on. You were so cute. Well, no. when you said you're like, oh, you're like the least awkward person I know. And I was like, wow, I will receive that. <laughs> you should receive that. I mean it. And I'll say it again. You're the least awkward person I know. You're like the most social, bubbly, like insightful at the same time person. But yeah, and we know how just dangerous loneliness is. So that was another huge factor on all of us. And I, I didn't mean for this conversation to come about that, but it's just been, mm-hmm. it's been so funny, Alyssa, because, you know, we've been connected for like over five years, I think. Like we've been connected a long time. And just like the people that we're seeing and the experiences they're having have changed so much. So I want to be up on the times to to let listeners know, like I'm reflecting on these changes as they're happening and I'm seeing how people are different. And a lot of it is coming back to this just assault on the brain that has been Uh happening for the past few years in every physical and mental direction. And of course, you know, New York City is like fully back in action. Like people are like back in the office and everything like that. But it doesn't mean that everyone's bodies have caught up with that. And I and I think about like the New York of the past, like, you know, maybe eight years ago or something, I was working like 90 hours a week. Like, I mean, literally like going from place to place. I just think now I'm like, I could never, would never want to, but also could never physically do what I did then. And it doesn't make me feel sad. It makes me feel like, oh my God, I'm treating my body with a lot more respect now, Mm -hmm. honestly, more than anything. But let's talk about that feeling that people have, Alyssa, where they were like, before this time, Mm -hmm. I was able to do this. And usually people say in a reflective way, that's a little bit hard on themselves. Like I used to be able to lift this much or do this much. Can we talk about what might kind of change our body's ability to do physical movement 
And how do we give ourselves grace or how do we kind of walk our way out of that, even that feeling, not walk our way out of being able to do what we used to do, but take me through that a little bit. Oh, such a beautiful and very common experience. Yes. I extend so much compassion towards that because it really lands with my own experiences as well, where I wasn't actually currently appreciating how my body was showing up at the present moment. I kept wishing her away, right? Wished away that she wasn't this tired or wasn't, didn't look like this, feel like this. And I always was just like completely obsessed with how I was before. And yet when I took the time to actually pause and really ask myself, well, how did you feel in that version? And actually the honest truth was, oh, you were like a perfectionist. You were overtraining. You weren't present with your friends. Like it wasn't actually a better version of myself, but my brain created the image and the visual and the experiences that that was better. And this, you can think about this, like when you're dating someone and you break up and then you're like, Oh my God, they were the best to me. And like, da, 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 da. And then like after time passes and you're like, Oh, that's weird. Like, actually I was miserable. I was so anxious. And it's, you know, this is like the way the brain works. It like, anytime there's this transition, it kind of always Rose looks color good. Yes, totally. exactly. That is such a true experience from a very scientific lens. So if you're in this position where you are thinking back of what your body used to be able to do, I would just recommend that the beauty of that is that your brain does remember. And that was such a like a uh, sentence that I think I held on with a lot of hope as well. Like my body remembers what it was like to be an athlete. My body remembers what it was like to enjoy family meals and not count calories or be distracted by, I ate too much rice or whatever it would be. And so your body does have these experiences really ingrained in her plasticity that um, she just needs to be reminded of. But right now, what she's needing and asking of you is to truly listen to her. And so I always like to describe it as like a teamwork, like a relationship. And it's like dating, right? When you date your body, it's like, cool. Like, what do you want? Like, it's all like, you know, great. And then you reach this place of like, gets a little comfortable. And then what you need to do is really take that time ask her how she's doing. What does she need? And sometimes the hard part is like when you're in a specific phase of your healing, you may not hear anything yeah. and that's okay. Sometimes it's just the act of pausing, asking, pausing, asking that then at some point you're like, Oh, that's interesting. Today I actually feel tired. And so it's the pause that actually interrupts autopilot and autopilot's purposeful for sure. And yet so many of us move into that. Like I'm just autopiloting my day that the brain actually needs novelty. So can we pause, create an interruption to our tendencies, settle into our body? And that's why for me, like I'm such a movement person because movement is one of the best ways to like experience our world, experience our body, get in touch with our feelings, but just really trying to connect more closely to the body itself and what she's actually experiencing. Is it sometimes with our nervous system, is it, is it true that it is sometimes challenging to the nervous system and can instigate a sympathetic response to move. And sometimes it can instigate a parasympathetic response and calm you. Like, is there a time and place for movement when it comes to brain-based movement? I think from the standpoint of brain-based movement, the work that I do, it's, it honestly, if I can like truly sum it up, it really did save my life because yeah. it was that yeah. safest next step for me to honestly just move my body without pain because anytime I tried to like hop on the treadmill okay I'm gonna do some squats my body was just like um Alyssa <laughs> can you stop this like we keep giving you chronic fatigue we keep giving you insatiable cravings every time you do these workouts can you just listen and so at that point I was like well what can I do do I just walk and like even walking at that point was stressful so what I had to do is like I remember my best friend was like you need to just go to the park bring your kettlebells, bring a book and sit next to them. And I was like, huh? <laughs> and so it was like this whole um, learning of like what I needed to do was like be outside, right? Be in the sun, be in nature, read a book, take my brain off of controlling my body, fixing my body, like working her to the ground and step into, yeah, like what does it feel like to breathe in my body? Wow, you can't take a full breath. You're not taking a full exhale okay, my logic, like intellectual brain is just like, okay, well then that trickles down too, you know, and I would go all into the intellect, which is honestly a safer place for me. I still need to work on like, continue to, yeah, yeah. continue to get in connection more and more with my physical body. But 
yeah, it's just this beautiful pathway of allowing your body to truly guide and lead you towards healing. So you can act much like your nervous system can stimulate muscle movement. It sounds like you can do the opposite direction too. That muscle movement can help to regulate your nervous system as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. That's and weird. I referenced before, like the brain has maps. So they're called like brain maps and every body part, we also have a gut map, um, but they get blurry depending on our health history. So if I have like a sprained left ankle and it wasn't properly rehabbed, my range of motion in my ankle maybe isn't as complete. Maybe there's like clicking, bumpy parts. And so if I am deciding to go on a run, but that ankle map is blurry, I may automatically feel stress on, you know, the first 30 seconds. And it's not because I'm out of shape. It's actually because my brain is like, Alyssa, we're running on one leg. Like, what are we doing? This is super stressful. Like, I don't know how you're doing this. We're not a three-legged race here. We don't have a partner. (laughs) This is very stressful. This is very stressful, Alyssa. Here's anxiety, you know? And so what we need to understand is that the brain relies on predictability. And if it can't predict that I have this left ankle, it's going to automatically put more threat into my bucket, make me feel more stressed. So then running, I just will chalk myself up to not being good at cardio, right? We all like have these things where like, well, I'm just not good at cardio, but it's like, oh, but if, if I have a blurry left ankle map, can I rehab that? And what happens to my run? And this is kind of the experiments I run on myself because I'm like, I want to try swimming. Okay. What is my assessment? Oh, these are the things that aren't working in my brain. Let me break this down, put myself into like a progression from a neuroscience lens. And then swimming becomes enjoyable versus like, you know, this thing I have to tolerate. Yeah. So some of what people think makes them exhausted about exercise is just that they're fighting their biology and their brain chemistry, it sounds like. Because, you know, I think people, again, it's so likely, and I I know this is a unique thing for New Yorkers especially, but we're very likely to attribute anything we can't do to just a lack of willpower. It's like, no matter what, it's just because we, and this is unanimous for all people. It's not just New Yorkers, but I notice it a lot in my like very high type A, you know, productive, like hyper productive people. Um, We are very likely to attribute it to a lack of willpower to why didn't we push ourselves? So how can people uh, in lieu of not everyone being able to always work with a practitioner, how can people Mm. start to inventory what feels exhausting for their bodies? If they are at a point where they feel stuck and they feel like I don't have willpower to do this, willpower is not taking me far enough. I'm blaming myself because I'm not moving or I'm hating movement. How do we find out what the heck's going on with our bodies? It's such a great question. It makes me think of a few things. I think that, again, I always like to start from this lens of like the reason why you are either actively choosing not to engage in exercise or resisting it intuitively. Like this is all like information, right? It's like, oh, okay, well, is getting outside of the house, like making your brain feel a lack of safety because maybe the neighborhood loop that you're taking, there's a lot of dogs and you have a history in your past where like you got bit by a dog, right? So then there's these things that would validate why something feels challenging. And I think I like to spend some time just being curious about that. So maybe that's something someone could start off with is like, why am I resisting this? Like what feels unsafe? And then once you kind of identify, let's use that walking example of like, oh, I'm not walking because there's these dogs that I pass and they are aggressive, da, da, da. Well, can we swap that for a different loop? Does that feel safer? And you know, what happens. And so I like to create all these micro experiments for my clients, because that's, I think the best way to really understand yourself. So let's say this person goes out on a different loop. She's like, okay, that was a little bit easier, but I still feel right. A little bit of like resistance to it. Well, maybe we just need to swap walking all together and start with breathing. Cause maybe every time she's like, I always like to say, if your breathing at rest is dysrhythmic, shallow, your second hyperventilation, when you add motion to it, it's going to be stressful. So we want to make sure that your breathing at rest is actually optimal to take on the load of walking. So maybe for this person, the safest first step is, can we get you to breathe a little bit more effectively so that when we start walking, it's not this, like, I need to like the three-legged or like the one-legged walk that I was describing. So your brain isn't like, oh my God, I don't know how to coordinate, right? Coordination lives in the cerebellum, coordinate my breathing with movement. 
So maybe that's a safer next step for someone, but it's like working your way back, starting with what doesn't feel safe, what's a perceived threat or danger. Can I make this safer? And then can I make this safer and safer and just keep going towards safety? Cause like you'll find a, like the safest first step that you'll find to be like very easy to implement, very easy to be consistent with. And then that becomes like, again, it's new pathway, but then we can build on top of. That's really, really helpful for people. And I think if the word safety feels like too unsafe, which is hilarious, but like, I know for some people it does, you can just say like, what sucks about this? What would suck about going for a walk this morning? You know, whatever the language is that you use with yourself, like, that's what I would say. Like, why does this suck? Oh, this sucks because I can't do this. Whatever that language is that you need to use to just kind of find out where you are. But what you're really talking about too is just applying a really strong amount of compassion with yourself and not saying like it's, you're not saying you're not coddling yourself. And and I know I often talk about this difference between compassion and coddling and saying, it's okay to not move, do whatever you want. Um, Although you're, you're saying that in a a different way. Of course, if that was what your body needed, but you're instead saying, where are you and where are we going basically? And I think that's really different for people. So this is really this is going to take me in like a little bit of a classic quiet the diet direction, which is something you and I have talked about in your guest expert series. And we've talked about before in that world of compassion versus coddling too. Mm. When we think about movement, let's, let's talk specifically about movement. Like how do we know when we're just saying you're beautiful the way that you are, you don't have to do anything. You're great versus let's do this together and be on each other's team. Like, how do we know when it comes to movement, if what we're doing is too coddly or if it's truly compassionate? Oh, that is such a great question. And I think you, out of every like health person out there that I know, you are always so great at bringing these very nuanced conversations to the surface that a lot of people internalize, right? They're like, I don't know what is like the difference. Like a great conversation I had in my group was like the difference between trauma and intuition. And we just spent all this time holding like the nuance of like, it can kind of look very similar, you know? And so I think the coddling, the compassion, and then like, okay, when can we actually push you a little bit? Obviously you and I would agree. It's going to depend, but some framework we can give you is there's going to be a point, I think, where you're going to feel really, you're going to actually crave movement. And it, for me, it always happens when my clients are like, So I was thinking about like maybe joining this yoga class, or I kind of feel like I should be doing more. I kind of wait until they actually initiate it. And usually it's been a pretty high percentage that I haven't like pretty high percentage that they've initiated versus me. And I'm kind of observing like, I'm like, okay, their pain is going down. We're like, we do a lot of cycle syncing with their training. So it's like, okay, they're kind of approaching, you know, this phase of their cycle where I think exercise is going to be more available to them. And usually what I'll hear is like, so this, I've been thinking like I've been wanting to, and usually it's actually a desire to, it's not a should. It's like, I kind of want to move my body. And I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like we have arrived. <laughs> like I'm like I celebrating on the inside and I'm like, okay, cool. Like, what would you like to do? Like what's yeah, you're, you're trying to keep it cool. You're like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, whatever. We can exercise. I don't care either way. You know? <laughs> Text you on the side, Michelle. Oh my God. <laughs> exactly. I know. Especially because we have, you know, the mutual client I'm thinking of too, which mm-hmm. I, I actually am going to bring her up in a funny way related to this okay. too. I love it. Is that this woman is one of the most spectacular people in the entire world. The most like accomplished in ways of just mm. like being a good human. I don't care about, even though she is also successful in the whatever capitalist parameters we want to think of, but just an amazing mother human person. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking for years about nervous system stuff. And then you came in and just brought, put it on like, you know, high drive and did these incredible work with her. And, you know, it's really funny because we've been working on like really big, important stuff in her life. And only recently after years, did we start talking about like actual content of her meals? So we've been joking basically behind your back, Alyssa, by the way, about um, the fact that (laughs) she's like, we almost were like crying in a session recently. Cause we were like, Oh, we have to talk about lunch options. And she's just so it's not like even a trauma response. It's just something very dysregulating about lunch specifically for her. I have a couple of clients, by the way, who just hate lunch. And it's just super like trigger. I don't know. Lunch is like, cause like dinner and breakfast foods are very laid out for lunch. Mm-hmm. For some people, it's just like, I hate lunch and don't know what to do about lunch. Um, and we were joking because we're like, 
Ugh, what drill is Alyssa going to make us do about lunch? You know, we have to like explore lunch or whatever. Cause me and her like could not come up with like a lunch option that she liked. And we were both so bored and so angry during the session. It was very funny, but it's just what is hard for someone at one point is not always going to be hard for them. And when something becomes hard, it is an invitation to explore while it's hard, why it's hard. And so it's, oh, yeah. you can make a joke out of it too. Like, yeah, this is ridiculous. Like we've dealt with the hardest life things ever when it comes to health. And now we're just like sad about lunch. And it's like, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, and we were so sad, Alyssa, like we were really sad about it. She's going to die laughing when she hears this. We both, I actually <laughs> looked up in the camera and she was like, almost like she was, she had a sullen face. And I'm like, we're just talking about like sandwiches. We're not, this isn't, you know, we, I'm like, we got it. We do have to pull it together a little bit. Like, I know we're bored, but it, we're not actually traumatized about this. Like we're fine, you know? Well, but I think that was such a good read on your end to be like, actually, I think, this person in particular, I think that there's this conversation around structure and flexibility. And when do you in, insert a little structure? When does it say structure feel safer totally. for this person too? Right. Totally. And so like, I think you did a really good judgment call being like, Hey, let's actually get into a little bit of the details. Let's sit in this discomfort, right? Everyone's like sit in discomfort, but like truly when you do it, you're like, yeah, I know why I'm not here. A hundred percent. Yeah. We're like, yeah. we hate it here. We both are uncomfortable talking about lunch, yeah. but I was like, I'm going to get a stupid document out and we're going to talk about stupid lunch. And that's just <laughs> what we're doing. And that's, it's fine. There are certain people, especially who are very structured, whose structure is extremely safe for them and structure feels very good for them. And there's times when it's not. And what I love that you brought about how you get so excited when your clients come to you and say, let's focus on this now, or I have a desire to work out. I feel that way with food too, where I'll have a client who will be working through the weeds of the internal conversation around food for a while. And then they'll come into my office and be like, Hey, I want to go on a keto diet. I'm like, cool, let's do it. Whatever. Like if you, like you, if, if you continue to open up that conversation, things just start coming up or you really, what's interesting about movement specifically is like, you forget that you were in pain in a good way. So then you'll just be like, yeah, I'd love to like run a mile today. Weirdest thing in the world, Alyssa. I just felt like I wanted to run today. And then you're like, okay, the conversation has now changed away from how am I not being in pain to what does my creative brain want for me? And I think sometimes we have to acknowledge when we're healing, it's not only that we no longer notice symptoms, which is what I'm always looking for in client sessions. And I know you're looking for too, but also when our brains get excited about new possibilities, that's when we know uh, yes. that we're in that healing phase too. Yes. Oh my God. So well said. I just, oh my God. There's so many times where like, I'll have a client say like, I don't know today. I just like randomly did X. Right. And I'm just like, tell me more. So not random. <laughs> Yeah. I'm just like, Oh my God, tell me more. And it's like, to them, it's like, like you said, right. It's like, it's not really random, but it is random from the standpoint of like, I have resisted getting in the pool to take a swim for years. And all of a sudden I just was swimming. And you're like, great. Because your brain saw it as a possibility for you to have safe movement. It can be cathartic. It's not this like sympathetic fight or flight. This is so stressful for you. It made me also think of just the way that we probably invite our clients in to like advocate for their like voice and their body. And I always like to ask them this question of like, well, what's your guess? Like, what's your best guess of why, you know, you wanted to swim or, you know, you don't like, you know, taking that morning walk. They're like, well, I think it's da 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 da. Oh my God. That's just them advocating for their intuition. And I'm like, okay, well, let's say it is that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> let's, let's say wink, wink that it is that because yeah, it obviously yeah. is that because it's a hundred percent that let's just say, let's pretend so that that's the answer. It's yeah. true. It's like when we're in those moments, it's almost like the more random it feels and the more inspired it feels, the more likely it's from that intuition piece. And I really do notice that like there is a time and place for making food changes. And I, I feel sad to have to tell clients when it's like not the time sometimes and they know it, they know it's not the time. Obviously they've expressed it's not the time, but it's also a relief to just say like, you know what, let's do the listening to our body. Let's do some symptom management for now. And then one day, like, I just love when my clients come to me and they'll be like, yeah, so I traveled, you know, I went on a seven hour flight and then I ate whatever in Europe. And then I came back and I'm just like, you weren't like leaving your house because of anxiety. Like, are you noticing that? And they're just like, oh yeah. Like, cause you, the, the fun part of our brain is that it catches up so quickly and moves so quickly through those phases that we don't joyously remember 
the details of the phase that we're in. So whenever you're in a phase where you feel stuck in your healing journey or you feel stuck in your movement or feel stuck in your food, just know that patience and communication are probably going to shift things more than trying to pummel through those stages in life. Because there is a stage in life where it's like, yeah, I'm going to go gluten-free for a little bit. And there's a stage in life where it's like, I can't do that. There's a stage in life where you're going to lift heavy. There's a stage in life where you're going to go ground in the park and stare at your kettlebells. (laughs) Totally. It makes me really think of, you know, this stuckness with actually a natural safe plateau. And I think when people think of like, let's say they're on a weight loss journey and they like reach this plateau, I think traditional methods are often like, okay, let's remove this. Let's add a little bit more. And I think what I've understood and observed with my students is that I think the plateau is actually a purposeful, safe next step in your weight loss journey, because what's happening is your very cognitive functional online brain of making all those decisions is like, we're pursuing weight loss in a sustainable way. I f- I'm proactively choosing this. I'm not trying to like, uh, you know, force anything. Like I'm doing it compassionately. But that old survival brain is like, but we remember when you <laughs> starved us and didn't feed us when we were hungry and oh. overexercised. And so it's this combative relationship. And I think that plateaus are kind of that that old survival brain being like, is this actually and a proactive choosing on your behalf? Are we doing this in a safe, like sustainable way? And then once you kind of just like hang out in that plateau, what you'll notice without changing anything is that then there's this new level that's reached of trust, right? With your body that then it's like, okay, it's like this exhale, the, that those two parts of your brain being like, okay, cool. I get it. She's proactively choosing this. We're okay. We're safe. Let's keep going. Let's see how this works. Which is yeah. why we loss often this very, and I, I just am re-endorsing what you're saying. It's often this very coy journey. You have to play with your body a little bit. Sometimes when you pummel it, you'll just notice like it feels like no matter how well I go in calories, how much exercise I'm doing, it's not making a difference. Like the jig is up kind of. Your body kind of realizes what you're doing and it's like, I'm, I'm kind of not into this. And I'm not saying that extreme <laughs> calorie restriction in the presence of stress does not always result in weight loss or does always result in weight loss because I think people would make that the argument of like famine or something like they're like people are very stressed in a famine and they're still losing weight. So I'm not saying that it makes it impossible to lose weight in a time of stress because I want to be sensitive and understanding of like the fact that that's also like very not true um, in some cases, but on a intentional weight loss journey where the reason that you're not eating is because of this stress you're putting on your body or that diet culture aspect or anything like that, your body is going to recognize that as not awesome for its future survival, right? So it is really important. Again, if we're talking about brain-based changes that you're always approaching with compassion, and it is the hardest and most frustrating thing that we can't shortcut often. And the shortcut is usually what the shortcut is actually what appears to be the harder thing, like Alyssa, you're like, do a visual drill with me for three minutes a day. Like that's what you're asking people to do. You're not asking them to train for an extra two hours, like is for what they think they need to do. So it's often just the connection is what's going to produce the greatest results. And the the getting your body to function as your body is intended to function very often starts in the brain because that is the command center of uh-huh. the body, obviously. So how what what tiny bit of advice I know you've given nuggets of wisdom left and right here and people are just full of safety after this conversation but (laughs) what advice could you give someone um who feels stuck in a fitness journey besides the incredible advice you gave um feel stuck in any sort of health journey to take that one tiniest what is that one tiny step to start with Mm, okay i have a couple of thoughts but the first one that comes up is to go on a walk and it's interesting Yeah. So when we feel stuck, um, sometimes physically moving your body forward is just that counter into like that counteracting to like that physical, like when you feel stuck, just look at what's happening in your body. Yeah. You're like sitting on the couch. You're like hours have gone by on social media, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say if you can just get movement from your body, you might find mental, more mental clarity. Um, I think that having safe, supportive conversations are also a beautiful thing to lean into, to just really like you and I talked about this loneliness that people carry. And sometimes stuckness is attributed to the fact that you don't have people to like 
hold space for you and listen to you and validate that you're not alone. I feel exactly like you. I felt stuck this last week and I didn't do X, Y, and Z. Sometimes just that sharing and that validation can help you then be like, oh, it's not just me. It's not my fault. And then who knows the next morning you're like, I'm going to take that walk or whatever it might be. But physical motion momentum forward just tells the brain, Hey, we're not stuck. Like we got this. And so this is not on a treadmill as well. Ideally it's going to be outside in nature. You can be barefoot. That's even better, but just the physical momentum of moving forward, I think is going to be a great thing to turn to. I have a joke with Kochko, um, Dr. Kochko, who I've had on the podcast, of course, twice. I have a joke with him where I say like, Oh, my back hurts. And he goes, Oh, did you walk today? Like, he's like, don't even, don't even message me about your back hurting. And now I actually am using this hypermobility coach. Um, Taylor Goldberg, amazing. Second mention, Taylor. I'm sending this up to her. She's unbelievable. But same thing where it's like, there is for my, I feel walking saved my pain like so much and has taken me out of pain in so many different ways in my life. Digestive pain, back pain, neck pain. Like walking is, it's very, it's, even in the experience of anxiety, cortisol buildup, adrenaline buildup, like movement forward is, it's almost like you're, if you're activating like the opposite, like you're saying of the freeze response. And sometimes, you know, it's so hard for people with anxiety to feel stuck in their physical head without creating those new neural pathways, without physically moving your body forward, your body. That's how we, like we said, how your muscle can signal to your brain. That's the way that it can be done. And uh, like our, our muscle is also an endocrine organ. Like it's, it's, it influences actual hormone signals throughout the rest of our body, but just visually seeing something new and the act of moving your body forward is there's about how many different ways it's influencing your nervous system. It's innumerable. Um, Mm -hmm. so I, I just, I just feel so personally grateful for the walking too. I, I feel there's nothing like it. I mean, I also think that there's other important movements obviously, but it is something very special about it. And almost in most flares of an autoimmune kind, walking is still accessible to people. Mm-hmm. Obviously, if you have full body pain, that's not. Um, if it, walking is not accessible to you, like you said, Alyssa, I've had clients where I said for three weeks, we're just going to show up at the track. You're just going to mm-hmm. sit in the, on the track in the grass part in the middle of it. Don't mm-hmm. walk, just sit on the track. And then again, one day randomly, it'll be like, I'm going to run this thing. Let your body tell you when it's time to, okay. And then tell me the stuck piece. Sorry to interrupt you. Actually is, it kind of makes me think of something that is probably, I'm going to use the word better, better than what I was going to originally say is mirror neurons. So if you are someone that has chronic pain, maybe watching, like go to a coffee shop and watch people walk, go on YouTube, just watch someone walk. Or visualize yourself walking. Yeah. Or visualize yourself walking. Like it's pretty powerful. Like I've, I had this one student who she would watch push up videos because she had a lot of like stability neck stuff going on. And so when she would watch someone do push ups, she could literally feel that visual input being processed in her brain the same way that then she felt like the vasculature, the strength embodiment of just watching someone do a push up. And I think that, again, there's more accessible steps for people as they're in the stuck phase to create action. And it's just about number one, yes, definitely scaling it back, but also getting creative. Like, do you have a laptop? Do you have YouTube? Like, can you just look up a video and watch that? And you will, with time, probably start to, again, entertain with curiosity, like, hmm, walking sounds kind of cool to do today. And allow It'll again, like, random. Mentioned- but yeah, it's very personal. <laughs> and also, <Freezing> quotes. <laughs> exactly. It'll feel random. Also, what you're saying is, Alyssa, again, if you can't do it through muscle, do it through vision. Yes. And just seeing those things is activating different parts of your brain. Mm-hmm. So I, I love that in a lot of other conversations we have, I say you can influence your nervous system through what you eat. You can influence your nervous system through how you move. And in this very specifically, we're saying you can influence your nervous system through muscular movement and through vision. And mm-hmm. if you can't do one, try the other, basically. Mm-hmm. Go, go any direction you need to go in. And there's a lot of options available to you because um, if you have, you know, even vision wise, I don't even know if your eyes have to be open. You can create visions, you know, and that, and that'll still create the same nervous system response, which is why anxiety is so powerful for people because you're creating a lot of visual (laughs) things that could happen. Use it to your advantage. (laughs) Exactly. What if the most wonderful thing happens um, in the entire world? Alyssa, I can never thank you enough for coming on today. I am 
So I am always amazed by you, but I was particularly amazed by you today. And I know that our audience will have gotten so much from you. Where can people find you, work with you, tell they're going to need more Alyssa after this? <laughs> well, thank you first off for having and inviting me. Um, I've always loved like our little like FaceTime hangouts and chats. And now that we are sharing a client, I think it's just really helped me also just learn so much more about how you hold space for your clients and just the energy you bring, your personality, like making light of very difficult experiences like anxiety and looking living in a body that you feel is very challenging to work with. So thank you. Don't call um, our little FaceTimes little, by the way. There's three hours <laughs> like the long. <laughs> <laughs> We've like needed water, like after our FaceTime. <laughs> yes, thank you, Angel. Um, they can find me. Um, Instagram is probably where I'm the most active, Coach Alyssa Chang. And then the that's the here. same... It's the same for my website, coachlissachang.com. I have a few offers of how I work with my clients. I do have one-on-one slots. Um, I primarily like to invite people through annually through an open enrollment through my program called Better Expert, where we are really going through this nervous system lens of how to train the brain to heal the body. I'm just now in a beta testing group for Better Expert Volume 2, which I'm so excited about because it's returning graduates that have worked with me in 2021 and just to get updates on how they've been integrating. I know the the 2021 crew. What a good crew. What a great crew. Exactly. Michelle is a guest expert inside of this program. Um, And yeah, it's just a very special opportunity to create more autonomy, more agency for them to program for themselves. So I'm always about like, how can I make you as independent as possible? You can choose to continue to work with me, but I want to create the critical thinking skills, the problem solving skills, the autonomy for you to feel like an expert in your body. And so a lot of my programs are designed in that way. Um, And the last thing is my membership. So I have a membership that is, again, all about the nervous system, tutorial videos, uh, like-minded students who are also just approaching this from a very compassionate and scientific lens. And it's a It's a community that I want to continue to build because I just think more people need access to this information and other people that are really trying to not do the very dogmatic, like no pain, no gain type of approach. They're like, no, I want to work with my body. And so that's the membership and how it's created. Well, I could not encourage all of you more to look at Alyssa's not only extremely informative posts, um, but her extremely aesthetic post. She has the cutest, patootiest Instagram in the entire world and just soul. Um, and I encourage you to work with Alyssa and check her out. Alyssa, thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming here today. And I, I just can't wait for this episode to air, honestly. Uh, thank you, Michelle. 